I'm uh, Kailash Bhatia. I work in London uh, at a place called Queen Square uh, in the National Hospital. And I have a particular interest in uh, dystonia. So I'm going to share some uh, ideas with you about how uh, nowadays uh, we would be evaluating uh, people with whom we think have dystonia. So before I make you aware that there is a location of dystonia, and this was uh, mainly sort of done by, to better define Uh, we can, uh, uh, sorry about the, okay. So the idea of this was to bring some uniformity uh, when we are evaluating our patients uh, with dystonia. And I'm going to be alluding to this uh, classification as we go on. So if you ask a lay person and say, what is dystonia? Uh, and as already Maya mentioned to you, people think about dystonia as a condition where there are abnormal postures. So these may be abnormal posture of the limbs. They may be abnormal postures of the neck. So we all recognize that. But uh, uh, in addition to these twisting movements, these abnormal postures, in the new classification, we have added a few things because we recognize that many people with dystonia also have tremor. So tremor is now an integral part of the definition of dystonia. We also recognize that people who have dystonia can get worse with regard to their dystonic movements when they do voluntary action. So they are sitting there, they get up, they do voluntary action and their dystonia can be worse. And we also found that dystonia can spread from one, so you're moving one hand, you can see some dystonic postures, and the other hand we call that overflow. So these three things have now come into the main classification uh, or the, uh, or the current definition of dystonia, that dystonia can be tremulous, uh, it can be worsened with voluntary action, and there is overflow. So just to sort of uh, show this, uh, this is somebody with uh, uh, clearly has neck dystonia, but also has tremor, and the tremor is an integral part of the dystonia. This is not something different. We don't say this is essential tremor or something like that. This is part of the dystonia. So the first thing I think we need to do when I see a patient with setting to me as dystonia is to ask the question, is this dystonia? So there are a number of things which can give you abnormal postures, but not every abnormal posture is dystonia. That is the key message. Most of the dystonias we have are mobile. So I can see that some of you here in the audience have dystonia. And you see that you're mobile, your dystonia is moving. People who have fixed postures, like this one or this one, here you have to be careful that is this really dystonia. Some of them can have muscular problems. Some can have uh, other problems which are not really dystonia. Dystonia arises in the brain. It is not muscular problem, although it causes problems with the muscles, with overactivity of muscles. But there can be some other disorders which can give you fixed postures. And we don't consider that as dystonia. So very important for us to establish that what we are seeing is a true dystonia rather than a fixed posture. And the other thing we use is that dystonia can has certain peculiarities which you don't see in other movement disorders. So certain dystonias are task-specific. For example, here, as you see this lady typing, you see that there is an abnormal posture of her fingers. Here's somebody who is writing and has an abnormal posture of his fingers when he's writing. And this is a peculiarity of dystonia, that you can have it as isolated or task-specific. Another peculiarity is the sensory jest. 
So a lot of people who have, for example, cervical dystonia in the form of torticollis will find that when they touch their face or they hold their chin or even just lightly touching their face can help their dystonia, as you see here. And this is a peculiarity we see only in dystonia. You don't see this in other movement disorders. So it's important for me when I'm evaluating a patient to see, to look out for a sensory jest. Uh, to look out for the overflow and so on because this is, as I said, is a diagnostic clue that you are dealing with uh, dystonia. Then what do we do? So once we've decided, yes, we are dealing with dystonia, then we have to look at certain uh, other things. Uh, and why we are doing this? Uh, we are looking at the clinical characteristics. But the reason we are doing this is that we want to arrive at the etiology. So the dystonia is just a symptom or a sign, but we want to know what is the etiology underlying this patient's dystonia, because that is very important for future treatments, it's very important for the prognosis of what we may expect with these people with dystonia. So in this context, we look at certain things. We look at the age of onset very important for us. We look at the distribution of the dystonia. Is it focal, meaning only affecting the neck or the face? Is it more generalized? Uh, is it a specific area uh, which is affected? And uh, in addition, we look at the temporal pattern. So certain dystonias only happen intermittently. We call them paroxysmal. <laughs> and the most important, which is a new thing from this new classification, is the dystonia isolated or is it combined with other things, other neurological or systemic signs? This is a very important new thing, uh, whether the dystonia is isolated or is it combined. So as I said to you, four things which are important for us. Age of onset, distribution, temporal pattern, and associated features. And in that regard, with regard to associated features, is the dystonia pure, isolated, or is the dystonia combined with other features? And as I said to you, the reason we are doing that is to find the etiology, because those clinical characteristics lead me as a clinician to recognize etiology. And we have now written a number of papers up to, for other people, for other clinicians, also to use this idea of isolated or combined dystonia to try and reach etiology. So in the old classification, we used to talk about primary or secondary dystonia. And this is still true to some extent because that's what we want to do. What do we mean by primary? Another term for primary is idiopathic. What we mean by that is that generally in these people, when we investigate them, we do brain scans, or even if you do pathology, you do not find any changes in the brain. You do not find any pathological abnormality in the brain. We call that primary or idiopathic. And we know now, and we have known this for a number of years, that primary idiopathic dystonia is usually isolated, meaning apart from the dystonia, you don't get anything else. And we also know that there is a distribution depending on age. If you get young onset dystonia, starting in the legs, usually in the limbs, it tends to spread, become generalized. It's pure, isolated. And many of those people have a gene called DYT1. In contrast, adult onset isolated dystonia is in the neck and the face. So your patients with torticollis, cervical dystonia, facial dystonia, 
they are usually adults. So adult onset dystonia will be craniocervical, torticollis, blepharospasm. So what does that also mean? It means that if people do not follow that pattern of the age of onset and their distribution, then this could mean that we are not dealing with a primary idiopathic dystonia. So it's very important, therefore, to recognize this pattern. So here is somebody with young onset dystonia, started in the legs, it spread, it generalized, isolated. Apart from the dystonia, he has nothing else. So this is fine for primary dystonia. Here is somebody as an example of adult onset dystonia. And I told you the adult onset are craniocervical, meaning the face of the neck. And she's got blepharospasm. And this lady here has torticollis. And apart from dystonia, they have nothing else. So this pattern and the age of onset is fine for isolated idiopathic dystonia. And there can be sometimes red flags. So here is an example where people may have isolated dystonia, but they have the wrong pattern for the age of onset. And here, even though it is isolated, you have to be careful because you don't call that idiopathic. These people may turn out to have some other underlying disorder uh, which initially is starting as isolated dystonia. So the clinician has to be familiar with these patterns. It is about pattern recognition. So here is somebody who is young, has isolated dystonia, started in the legs, spread. That's fine. That's idiopathic dystonia. He may have a DYT1 gene. Here is a woman. She's in her 50s or 60s. It affects the neck and the face. Apart from dystonia, she has nothing else. This is okay for idiopathic dystonia, primary dystonia. But here, this is a young woman who has developed cranial dystonia. This is not okay. Even though this is isolated dystonia at this time, there is every possibility that there is an underlying some other cause of dystonia in this lady and it's likely that she has a heterodegenerative cause. And not surprisingly, when we investigated her, we find that there is accumulation of brain iron uh, in her. In the primary dystonias, the idiopathic dystonias, the brain scans are normal. So quite often people don't even investigate them because they know that the scans would be normal. But if you get the wrong pattern, as it is in this lady, because she's too young to get craniocervical dystonia. She should be 50 or 60 to get the craniocervical dystonia. And hence, when she was investigated, it was found that she has iron accumulation and the so-called eye of the tiger on the scan. And similarly, just to show you the example the other way, here is a lady who comes late in life. She has craniocervical dystonia, but it is not isolated. So even though she's got blepharospasm, uh, she's got uh, a, a cranial dystonia, she's a woman, which is right for that, and you would have said that is right for that age. But when we examine her, she even has a sensory jest, interestingly. But when we examine her further, you can see she's in a wheelchair. There's no reason for a primary idiopathic dystonia to be in a wheelchair. And she's got balance problems. And therefore, when we investigated this lady, she had a very rare condition called neuroferritinopathy. So using the pattern of isolated versus combined, using the pattern of the age of onset and the distribution of the dystonia helps us diagnose whether we are dealing with primary isolated dystonia or so-called idiopathic dystonia, or we are dealing with a secondary heterodegenerative dystonia. So we have written this paper recently as a review article in Nature Reviews, and here we point out some red flags against the diagnosis of idiopathic primary dystonia. So I've already mentioned this to you. Unusual pattern with regard age of onset and distribution, and any other things. So history of exposure to drugs, perinatal injury, lot of involvement of the swallowing, lot of tongue protusion, fixed dystonia, all of these are red flags against the diagnosis of idiopathic primary dystonia. 
So I've just given you a little background of how we would go about deciding when we are clinically evaluating a patient. So I said to you, first thing, is this dystonia? Second thing, look for the peculiarities of dystonia, the overflows, the sensory gest. Third thing, look at whether the distribution and the age of onset and whether the dystonia is isolated or combined. Now, one of the things which has happened in the field of dystonia is that there have been advances in the genetics of dystonia. So, the large proportion of dystonia is still probably non-genetic, but more and more genes are being found both for isolated dystonia and for combined dystonia. And in this paper, we have covered how to look for genetic causes in those with isolated and combined dystonia. So I'm just going to take you through some of the isolated dystonia uh, genetic causes, some which cause generalized dystonia, and some which cause focal isolated dystonia. So the classic one, which we've already heard about earlier today, is the Oppenheim's dystonia, or which is related to the DYT1 gene. And this was the first gene, that's why it is called DYT1, dystonia 1 gene. This was the first gene which was found for dystonia. And it is a little more common in people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Very typically, it has a very early onset. So this is a child, as you can see. They usually start with dystonia of their feet or legs. Then the dystonia can spread, but generally it spares the craniocervical region. Uh, so if you get a child with pure dystonia, uh, one of the things you're thinking about is DYT1. Another gene which has been found to cause isolated dystonia, but this usually comes in people who are middle-aged, uh, is DYT6 or TAP1. And this causes craniocervical or facial dystonia. So in this lady, for example, she's got dystonia on speaking and her jaw gets dystonic and her tongue comes out uh, while she's speaking. This is an abnormal posture of the jaw and the tongue. And she's got laryngeal involvement, so she's got a spasmodic dysphonia as well. Her imaging and all other characteristics are normal uh, and uh, she was found to have the DYT6 gene. So what we have found in the people with DYT6 is that very often they have laryngeal involvement, involvement of the larynx causing problems with their voice. And unlike DYT1, which starts in the legs and spreads upwards, DYT6 starts here in the craniocervical region and in some people can spread downwards. So it's a bit different from what we see in DYT1 pattern. So we are recognizing patterns also of the genetic forms of dystonia. And there are some new genes also added. I, I keep stressing to you that these are rare causes of genetic dystonias, but they are important causes because they help us understand the pathophysiology, the underlying basis of dystonia. So for example, this one called ANO3 is telling us that ion channels may be involved in the pathogenesis. Uh, the genal gene tells us that there may be something wrong with the dopamine D1 signaling. So although these are rare causes, they are important for us to, rec uh, to, to find because we can find out what is going on in the mainstream dystonia, learn about the pathophysiology of dystonia from these rarer types of dystonia. So this is a you know three coming back to this more and more people are finding this. Uh, if you were thinking about it, you would say it's probably less than two percent of dystonias are related to the NO3 gene. But as I said to you, it's important because we are learning that ion channels may be implicated in dystonia. And the phenotypic spectrum, meaning what you see clinically in these people is very similar to the tremulous dystonia we see quite often in our patients. So here is our man. Uh, he's got uh, you know, three mutations. And you can see he's got late onset cervical dystonia with a lot of tremor. Uh, so tremor seems to be a feature in many cases of you know, three uh, mutations. 
And there is a, a further advances. So all these genes which I told you about so far are autosomal dominant. We have now found that there are some autosomal recessive primary dystonia genes. So what you mean by that is that you need one bad gene from each parent and only the child who has both two bad genes uh, will develop the disorder. So one important cause of that is hippocalcin gene mutations. And again, this is from our group. Uh, this is a family here. Uh, there are three individuals affected. You can see in all of them there is oromandibular and cranial dystonia, but there is also some involvement of their trunk. And these were found in another family as well uh, to have mutations in the HPCA gene. And this has recently been found also by other groups. So uh, again, although this is a rare cause of uh, uh, dystonia, it's an important cause because again, in this we find that there is a abnormality with the voltage dependent calcium channels. So we didn't know about this in the past, that these uh, ion channels may be implicated in the day-to-day -day dystonia which we see. So this is an interesting area which is developing. So, so far I have told you about this. Uh, I told you about isolated dystonia and I showed you some forms of generalized dystonia, which was a DYT1. And then I told you a little bit about isolated focal dystonias and I told you a little bit about DYT6 and NO3 and GINA. Now I'm moving here to combined dystonia. So what do I mean by combined? What I mean is that in addition to the dystonia, these people have other features. So here we have just got two examples. Myoclonus means jerks or Parkinsonism. So we're going to look at some of that. So here's a lady who has dystonia of the neck, but you can see that in addition, she has these very marked jerks. This is different from tremor. This is called myoclonus. And this lady has myoclonus dystonia, meaning jerks and dystonia. So it's a combined dystonia. And this is, we know now, very sensitive to alcohol. So they take a little bit of alcohol and they pint a small glass of wine and their jerks and the dystonia gets better. So this is called alcohol sensitive myoclonus dystonia. Now, although this is affecting the neck, most of these people start very early in life. So usually the dystonia starts in the first decade, meaning below the age of 10 years. Uh, sometimes very early, four months as you see here, three years, two years is the age of onset. The distribution of the myoclonus is particular. It affects the neck and the upper limbs mainly myoclonus being jerks. And as I said to you, as a child, of course, they don't drink alcohol, but later when they find, when they grow up, that a little bit of alcohol helps them. And they also have a family history, which is very strong. This is a highly penetrant gene. So it's an autosomal dominant family history, um, meaning you need one bad gene coming down vertically, 50% chance of inheriting it. So apart from... Uh, the epsilon sarcoglycan gene, which I just showed you, causing the myoclonus dystonia. There are some other rare genes being described, also causing myoclonus dystonia. Again, this is from our group here. It's called KCTD. And again, we find that this gene also has a role in calcium signaling. So this is becoming an important theme in dystonia, that there may be some abnormalities with ion channels, particularly with calcium signaling. So this is important. There are some other genes also now described for myoclonus dystonia. So what we are trying to do here is, as I said to you, we want to decide, is it isolated or combined? And then we form this syndrome. What is it combined with? Is it combined with myoclonus? So then these are the various etiologies. Is it combined with Parkinson's? So then there are various etiologies. So for example, Young onset Parkinson disease can sometimes start with dystonia, dopa responsive dystonia, and then there are a variety of other causes, brain ion accumulation disorders, and so on. So you want to make this syndrome so that you can arrive and think about the underlying etiologies. Is the dystonia combined with a lot of oromandibular involvement, as in this child? And then you see that it 
can be due to drugs, it can be, so you can narrow down the etiologies if you're making the syndrome. Because otherwise, the causes of dystonia are manifold, too many. So we need to make these syndromes so that we can narrow down the investigations. Uh, dystonia with peripheral neuropathy, you're looking for certain causes, some rare conditions. Dystonia with retinitis pigmentosa, dystonia with dementia, dystonia with supranuclear gaze problems in the eye movements. So for the clinicians, it's very important to make these, uh, <clears throat> make these uh, combinations so that they can look at the underlying etiology. There are certain types of dystonia and deafness uh, related to mitochondrial disease uh, and also a rare condition called woodhouse sakati syndrome which gives rise to alopecia, loss of hair, dis dis uh, dystonia, diabetes and deafness. So a number of different conditions, rare conditions, uh, where you get a combination of these different things. And there is conditions where you get dystonia and anarthria. So these are people who have dystonia but very marked involvement of their speech so eventually actually they can't speak at all and that's called uh, anarthria, uh, uh, aphonia, number of causes of that. Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning this to you is because recently there has been a gene found where there is a combination of young onset dystonia uh, with anarthria or speech difficulty. And these people have a very characteristic appearance. And uh, as a pediatric neurologist or as a pediatrician, you can recognize them. So they have a short stature, so they don't grow very tall. They have microcephaly and they have a particular appearance of their face. So these are all children and they have a facial elongation and a broad bulbous nose. So we can recognize these children and this is a very turning out to be an extremely common cause of childhood onset dystonia, this particular gene called KMT2B. So in this paper alone, so normally when you have papers on genetic dystonia, there are usually one or two families or few cases but here there were 26 or more cases described in just in one paper. So we are realizing that this may be a very important cause of childhood onset uh, dystonia. And one can recognize this from the physical appearance of these particular children. I do think that uh, uh, a number of these dystonias happen in childhood. Many of these children are misdiagnosed as cerebral palsy or something like that. And it is very important for us to recognize not just the, and help not just the people with the adult onset dystonias, which we are doing, but also to keep in mind uh, many of these childhood onset uh, dystonias uh, uh, where these children are quite markedly affected. So this is about this KMT2B gene, 27 cases. I've shown you uh, 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 how they look like. So now we talk about some practical issues. What would be our approach? So as I said to you, the first thing which you want to do is to make the syndrome. You want to take a good history. And the most important thing is, is it isolated versus is it combined dystonia? This is the new way we are thinking about dystonia. And this is helping us come to etiology. Then you look at what is the temporal course. What is a body distribution? And all of these are combined. I've already gone through this with you. Once you have defined the dystonia syndrome, then you can do your diagnostic workup. Then you can think about what is the etiology. You cannot just do all the etiologies in every patient you have with dystonia. So as a clinician, it is very important for you to follow this scheme where you look at the patient, isolated or combined, form the syndrome, and then think about the etiologies underlying that syndrome. There are certain things which are routine, so you may think about doing a brain MRI or copper cerebroplasmin, and certain things which are specific. So thinking about the syndrome, you may do particular genetic analysis, particular analysis, uh, and, and so on. So that that's would be the approach to how you might investigate the patient. This is my own uh, suggestion, um, I, what I would do in my practice. If I have somebody who has isolated dystonia and is young, I would send for the DYT1 gene, particularly if they are Ashkenazi Jewish. If they are a young adult, 
ages 20 to 30, 35, uh, and they have isolated dystonia, particularly if there is laryngeal involvement. In some of these cases, I ask for the DYT6, although it's difficult to get genetic analysis done. And if it is combined dystonia, meaning it's complicated with additional signs, then that depends on the syndrome. So I have particular etiologies, for example, dystonia with deafness. I have particular etiologies for dystonia with Parkinsonism or dystonia with myoclonus. And that therefore depends on the syndrome, how you might investigate them. Again, just a few sort of uh, few things. If it is isolated dystonia, you might debate, but I'd like to do a simple brain image, perhaps an MRI. And, and if it is a young person, I might do a test for Wilson's disease. If it is combined, then I'm asking definitely for an MRI. And I'm asking an MRI with SWI imaging or T2 star imaging because this can pick up iron. And many of these cases have iron accumulation. Don't forget Wilson's, it's treatable. And in the others where you have combined dystonia, where you're thinking about heterodegenerative causes, then you may do a panel of blood tests or genetic tests depending on what the what the combination is. So the routine panel would be routine biochemistry, copper ceruloplasmin, white cell enzymes, organic acids, EEG, MRI, where you are thinking that you may be dealing with a heterodegenerative cause. So I'm, uh, I know that uh, I, I'm not supposed to be talking about uh, um, treatment, but I know that Mary Witherley is not here, so I was told to put in a couple of slides about treatment. And I just want to say general principles about treatment. Every patient with dystonia is different. So although we have a generalization uh, of that, for example, cervical dystonia or cranial cervical dystonia, we may use botulinum toxin, uh, it's important to keep in mind a number of factors. What is the age, age of onset? What is the distribution of the dystonia? Meaning, is it focal or generalized? Are there associated jerks or tremors? What is the occupation of the person? What is the functional disability? I mean, there are some people who have a little bit of neck dystonia and they say, look, doctor, I can manage without anything. I'm okay. Uh, I don't need to have it, which is fine. You've got to respect that. So it, it does depend on what there is. Not just, just because they have dystonia, everybody requires botulinum toxin. That's not necessary in some cases. Of course, they need it, you give it. If there are associated problems, we are recognizing that a lot of patients with dystonia, apart from having the motor symptoms, meaning the movement symptoms, have non-motor symptoms. So depression, anxiety, uh, social difficulties are a problem, as you heard already, uh, causing difficulties in quality of life. And in some people, these have to be addressed as well. Just treating the motor signs is not enough. You may need to treat the non-motor features as well. And that might actually help the outcomes of the motor problems too, if you help, for example, the depression and anxiety. So it's a very busy slide. I don't think you can actually see it. But essentially what it says here is that if you've got focal dystonia, the first thing you go to and which be the top of your treatment would be botulinum toxin injections. But if you've got generalized dystonia, it's oral medication like anticholinergics, baclofen, levodopa and others. It's also important that physical therapy, physiotherapy, biofeedback, etc. is given to people. And if you've got combined dystonia, for example, myoclonus dystonia, there are certain drugs. Zonisamide is a drug which is being mentioned and has been shown to be useful for myoclonus dystonia. If you've got dystonia Parkinson's, then you treat with levodopa. If it is dystonia with spasticity, you treat with baclofen and anti-spasticity drugs, and so on and so forth. In the generalized dystonia, if the oral medications are not useful, then the next thing, of course, an important thing is deep brain stimulation surgery. Uh, but in the focal dystonias, we very rarely require deep brain stimulation surgery because botulinum toxin injections uh, help a lot of these patients. So uh, I think that's it. Uh, so this is the summary for you. Uh, the clinical spectrum of dystonia is expanding uh, apart from the abnormal postures, uh, tremor, jerks, myoclonus, 
and non-motor features, anxiety, depression, are now being recognized as part of dystonia. There are a number of genetic advances. We are finding more and more genes, and these genes will help us define phenotypes, but also help us understand the underlying pathophysiology, even of the mainstream dystonias, the non-genetic dystonia. And it is now possible to make these syndromic associations, make, make these combinations, and then narrow down the differential diagnosis to particular etiologies in the complex cases. And I think further advances will be made in the genetics of dystonia. We don't need to hide from that. And I think there will be further advances also made in the identification of risk factors causing dystonia. Because dystonia is peculiar. Uh, it has a low penetrance. Even if you have the gene, not everybody who has a gene develops the disorder. So there, there, that implies that there may be some other genetic or maybe non-genetic environmental causes which is making the dystonia manifest in some individuals who are carrying the gene but not in other individuals who are also carrying the gene. So this is an important message. If we understand that, we may be able to prevent uh, those who have the gene from developing the dystonia. And this improvement of the pathophysiology and improvement in the understanding the basic mechanisms, maybe now that we have the genes, we can have newer animal models, and this may potentially help develop curative or at least better treatments in the future. Thank you. Never. <laughs> Only on these terms. Well, I might qualify that. As I said, that if I use the wrong age, so 25, 50, cervical dystonia, particularly with involvement with a tap, UIT6, but in the cervical dystonia late on, one, unless there's a very strong family, most of these people are sporadic. So if you've got a very nice uh, family and you think you can find a new gene, then yeah. But it's usually on a, you know, on a research basis. As a, as a standard uh, investigation, no, never. change the regular injection time or shorten the injection time or I want your opinion. Yeah. I think I, I, there are two, two things I would say about that. Uh, so, like you rightly said, the question is, is the patient really wearing off that early? Uh, and if that is the case, or if they don't have a good enough benefit, what is the reason for that? Is the reason because maybe the right muscles or the right doses are not being done uh, to begin with? Or is it because the expectation of the person is too much? And sometimes a lot of the non-motor features may also contribute to this. So they have anxiety, depression, there are other problems, then um, they don't find that the benefit is enough. So I think uh, one, everybody's different, so one has to weigh these particular possibilities. Uh, like you, I don't like the idea of making the duration of the if, uh, shorter and shorter because we know that there may be a possibility of an increased resistance in people who are having injections at less than eight or 10 week interval. Uh, resistance is another <laughs> difficult area, but uh, um, 
Yes, I think in general terms, what I would say is that it's probably not a good idea. And most studies have shown that the duration can be 12 to 14 weeks in general. So uh, there must be a reason why they are coming back earlier. There could be a reason that we haven't done the injections properly or the doses are not right or the muscles are not right. Or there are some extraneous factors like depression and anxiety which are playing a role here and that's not making them happy with everything including the, including the treatment response. Yeah, right. Thank you. I would I would like your opinion because it's. Mm. I think that it was actually uh, somehow pharmaceutical company pushing this uh, intervals and all of this. And even sometimes, I mean, there are a lot of functional problems in dystonia. So some of them, I have even few patients that I'm treating them for many years now mm -hmm. with the placebo, with the approval of ethics committee. I mean, it's not so often, but still there are. Or this, or this non-motor. Yeah, thank you. I think that's important. Uh, okay. Uh, I have one question about hereditary uh, dystonia. Uh, I wonder if uh, there is uh, a family where one person have light onset laryngeal dystonia, but mild. Uh, another person have cervical dystonia. And uh, a third uh, uh, uncle uh, have um, a slight blepharospasm. They're all fairly light onset, but in addition, many other have a tremor in the hands or um, uh, active specific tremor um, that uh, somewhat worsen with age. Uh, mostly onset is between 40 and 50 years. Could that be hereditary? Well, it is hereditary because you've got three people affected in the family firstly, right? So I think the question you're really asking is, are the people who have the tremor also possibly affected by the same gene? I think that's really what you're asking. Uh, and the answer to that is it's possible. Uh, so, for example, the NO3 gene family which I showed, the uh, family members are showing you, some people clearly had cervical dystonia uh, and tremor, and there were others in the same family who carry the gene who only had tremor, okay? So, uh, and they were actually labeled as essential tremor because they did not have much in the way of dystonia at that time. Only when they, later in life, they would have gone on to develop some dystonia. So the, I think the answer to your question is when you say there are three people affected in the family, is clearly a genetic uh, cause. Uh, second, are the people who are having the tremor manifestors of the same gene, but in a different way, only with tremor? Yes, it's possible. So uh, when we are doing genetic analysis, we would say these people are definitely affected, the ones which you mentioned. And then the ones who have the tremor, we would say possibly affected, and if you find that they are segregating when we do the genetic analysis with a particular gene, we would say, yes, they are showing the manifestation of that gene. So yes, the answer yeah. is yes. Thank you. And we don't like to use the word hereditary because although it, I understand what you're saying, the question is, is it genetic in a sense? Right? I think that uh, what you show, it's important for a patient that uh, actually it's a very low penetrance because, I good. mean, most of the patients ask you about yeah. their you know, children and so on. So that's important yeah. for a consulting, actually. But I also want to sort of elaborate on that so I don't want to alarm people who are maybe listening uh, where some people have a clear cervical dystonia. This family seems a particular family. But there are people who have cervical dystonia, very clear, late onset, idiopathic cervical dystonia, and maybe there are some people in their family who have a bit of tremor. That doesn't necessarily make those tremor people have the same disorder. The family you're mentioning is very different because they've got three people with clear dystonia, and in them, that family, if there are some people with tremor, one may have to consider the possibility that it could be related. But if there is somebody who is just one solitary person who's got cranial cervical classic, you know, late onset dystonia, and there is somebody else in their family with a bit of tremor, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a genetic condition. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? 
Yeah, I would like to thank you very much, of course, and all of you, I hope. Thank you for giving us this opportunity, Monica. Okay. Then I want to say a few last words. I want to especially thank you to Professor Maya Ralya and Professor Kailash Bhatia uh, for taking the time during this busy, busy period uh, and uh, talking about Estonia. And thank you to all of you that was here and also those who follow us live stream. Uh, you can uh, see uh, the different presentations a little bit later on our uh, on the Estonia Europe YouTube channel, uh, and we will keep you uh, updated. Thank you.